Uh, welcome everybody, thanks to you all for being here today. Thank you to Mary Watson for taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us. Um, represented in the room is, um, is a group of leaders uh, from the real estate industry in Ottawa. And that group uh, of leaders consists of building owners, developers, um, managers of real estate. And um, the relationship that we have uh, with the mayor's office in the city is a critically important one. So having some time to spend with you is, uh, is helpful for the entire group. So appreciate that. But before I get into the formal questions, um, I was having dinner with my family. And my 16-year-old said, well, how do you address the mayor? And I said, well, I, that's a good question. I never really thought about that before. But uh, I call him Mayor Watson. But I've heard people call you Jim. I've never heard anyone call you James, but I've heard them call you Jim. I've heard them call you Mayor, uh, Mayor Jim. I've heard them call you Mayor Watson uh, and your worship. So for the benefit of everybody in the room, when we run into you at these events, what would you like us to refer to you as? Your Holiness. Your Holiness, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Good. All right. So <laughs> there you have it, Your Holiness. Um, we'll, uh, we'll keep going on that theme. Uh, so we're going to start out with a set of questions around uh, economic drivers in the city of Ottawa. And when you were first elected mayor in 1997 uh, through to 2000, that was during really a peak in Ottawa's technology boom, led by local companies like Mitel, Newbridge, Nortel, Corel. Um, and that boom lasted for a period of time, slowed down, but we're now into a, a period where we're seeing technology as a major driver of the economy in Ottawa. And I'm curious, uh, from the technology sector, what, what companies, what industries are you really excited about here in Ottawa? Well, I, I think that's a good question because uh, we're really on a, on a roll right now in Ottawa. When you look at the un unemployment rate, uh, went down to about 4.7, 4 4.6%, uh, which is a good news, bad news story. Uh, and you're also seeing the high-tech sector, particularly in Canada, but also in the downtown core like Shopify, uh, really uh, expanding at a, at a pretty remarkable rate. And, um, you know, it's not just uh, Canada, which is very important. It's the largest high-tech uh, park in, uh, in Canada, as a matter of fact. On a per capita basis, we're, we're uh, doing much, uh, you know, punching well above our, our weight. Uh, but you look at a company like Ross Video, uh, which I had uh, David Ross, the president, came in and spoke at our breakfast series at City Hall uh, earlier this week. And most people probably have never even heard of Ross Video. They think, is this like blockbuster video? What kind of a company is he running? But he's running all of these switching systems for the Academy Awards, the Super Bowl, and all sorts of other uh, television production. He has hundreds of employees growing at a really fast pace. I think growth of 16, 17 percent uh, uh, for the last uh, 15 years. Uh, and uh, it is an exciting time, but there's also, uh, you know, the, the industries of the future, autonomous vehicles and AI. We have, uh, for, for those of you who know where um, the old uh, Government of Canada Agricultural Research Park is, right across from the Sportsplex. Sorry, my back is to, to this half of the group, but uh, it's, um, it's the old uh, Agricultural Research Centre. And uh, we have some really exciting plans. We've been working with Steve Willis and, and his group at the City of Ottawa in the private sector to create an autonomous vehicle track on that site. There's 17 kilometers of paved road <coughs> in that uh, park. Uh, it's been sitting vacant. It was shut down in 1984. And uh, we have installed uh, the city traffic lights and stop signs and so on, so we can actually have uh, the most comprehensive and uh, most realistic um, uh, tra test track for uh, autonomous vehicles. And when you Couple that with QNX and Ford that are very active, involved in, in autonomous vehicles. Uh, we're on the cutting edge. And uh, that same site uh, is also going to have our new film studio. We've uh, struck a deal with Tribro Productions, and uh, that's an important part of our, our economy, the, the cultural sector. Uh, probably five to 600 jobs will be created when the, the, the film center and the sound stage is, is built uh, at that site. You know, we have a really vibrant uh, film industry, but we're missing one important piece, and that piece is a soundstage. So I, I was actually out touring a, a movie set a couple years ago in the East End in Gloucester in Orleans. It was an old uh, grocery store just beside uh, Place d'Orleans, and it had been converted into a soundstage. And uh, I got to meet Michael Keaton, who was one of the stars and uh, the producer, and, and it was a, f a film called A Penthouse, which was not a porn, uh, it was uh, about a penthouse apartment in New York, and they converted this old, you know, fruit company into a um, into a soundstage. But even uh, with that, the producer said, uh, even with those incurred costs of building their own soundstage, 
Ottawa was the least expensive market to film in in Canada. You know, Toronto and Vancouver really, uh, you know, the, the price of everything from catering to hotel rooms to, to uh, employees is very, very high. So we've got a lot of uh, different irons in the fire. It's not just traditional technology, which is big for us. You know, we have the largest employer in Ottawa, as you know, is the government. The second is high tech. Third is tourism and hospitality. But uh, we're trying to diversify the economy so that we don't put all our eggs, as we've traditionally done in Ottawa, in the government basket. And what ends up happening is, you know, the previous government uh, cut the public service by about 18,000. This government has increased it by about 18 or 19,000, and it's that challenge of trying to stabilize the economy. And if we can do that by uh, rolling out the red carpet instead of the red tape on things like the film studio, autonomous vehicle tracks, and the big advantage we have on, on autonomous vehicle testing is we have four distinct seasons. You know, they need winter testing, and we have winter in Ottawa. So uh, it's one of the things that, that we're pitching as we go out and sell Ottawa around the world. Well, that's great. And you're kind of, uh, you're making my job easy because you're answering my questions before I even get to them. So that's great. No, that's all good. Um, and I, my next question was, and I think you've kind of covered it, but, uh, you know, what is the city's role, um, you know, related to investment in, the, in, in working with the private sector in Ottawa to help encourage private sector investment in all these sectors? And so you've just talked about autonomous vehicles and the film industry. And is that a role that you see the city continuing to play going forward? I think, you know, what we have to do is offer uh, reliability and stability to people who want to invest in our city. And that's why I say, you know, we want to roll out the red carpet and not the red tape. We want to encourage people to come and invest here. It is a very stable economy. If you look over the last 10 or 15 years, uh, you know, the unemployment rate is consistently uh, around the same. We've got a very low unemployment rate now. Um, you know, in terms of the, uh, the, the federal public sector, uh, the regulatory agencies, they're all located here. Uh, the quality of life, I think, is something that, that uh, we have to pitch all the time because companies today and individuals, as we all know, can locate anywhere in the world. They, they don't have to be in one particular uh, geographic area. So when we lead delegations, Steve and I were on a delegation to the Netherlands and two years before that to India and two, two years before that to Beijing, uh, we do it with uh, business leaders who want to sell products and services to foreign countries that end up helping our, our jurisdiction and help create jobs here in Ottawa. So, you know, I think we have to be predictable and, and reliable so that people are not going to invest. And then all of a sudden, because there's a, you know, one member of city council or a neighborhood group is opposed to something, uh, we fold like a house of cards. We've got to let people know that, you know, our official plan means something and our zoning bylaws mean something and at the same time we're willing to work with individuals uh, to ensure that their investment um, is um, is secure and stable and uh, it creates economic activity for us and the population of the city of ottawa well that that's a pretty critical element when um, you're taking risk investing capital and in the case of this industry um, you know creating the built environment uh, where people live and do business uh, it's that certainty is a critical element of that and so one of the concerns that we always have as an industry especially inside the green belt uh, is how uh, do we get more certainty around processes specifically around planning and and uh, you know getting projects approved and so with respect to that um, you know, is uh, the TOD guidelines have been great. Uh, there's a lot of development occurring along the LRT line, which I'm sure you're encouraged about. Um, so, is that something that you think you can see continuing going forward from a from a planning perspective, and something that uh, you know we should take you know as an industry is you know encouraging that we're going to continue to get support around certainty. Yeah, TOD or transit oriented development is is. Um uh, very much a pillar of our economic development plan. You know, we're, we're spending 2.1 billion on phase one, uh, over 4 billion on phase two, and just to remind people, because we live and breathe LRT, that, that you know, sometimes we assume everyone else is, knows every aspect of it, but the reality is uh, phase one is up and running. We had a couple of bumps along the way, but it's, you know, a new system. Uh, people are getting used to it. Uh, it's, you know, we've had uh, a you know, very good week this week in terms of um, rush hour. Uh, I've taken it probably, you know, of the 18 days it's been up and running, I think I've been on it 16 days, and uh, it is really quite a remarkable system. And, you know, if it hadn't been raining and I was not that, that wimpy, I would have taken the train from downtown and got off at the Via station, walked over the Max Keeping Bridge, and I would have been right here. So it's, uh, it's going to encourage people to develop around, and you see on Blair Station, which is the eastern terminus, 
Uh, one apartment is already up. I think it's Rio Can that's yes. doing it. The second one is in the ground. And they have plans, I think, for three or four more towers on that site. And that allows people to, whether they're in, in school at Carleton or Ottawa U or Algonquin, or uh, they want to live in a different part of the city and work in a different part, to not even have a car. They can hop down, walk you know, a couple meters to the train station and get on uh, you know, the train that brings you downtown literally in 15, 17 minutes from the east end and the same way from the, the west end. So we want to incur continue to encourage that. And at times we get, you know, we're talking over lunch, Hugh, about you know, uh, you're working on a project right across from the Westboro train station, which, which will be a train station in the next couple of years. And you know, we had a couple of councillors vote against that. And I, I, you know, when I spoke at the meeting, I said, if we can't even uh, you know, support TOD right across the street because a few people in the neighbourhood are against it, how are we ever going to be taken seriously? So you know, the thing passed, I think it was like 22 to 2 or something like that. So the, the vast majority of members of council understand that if we're going to invest all of this money, your tax dollars, into L LRT, We've got to make sure that more and more people use it. And the way we do that is to encourage growth around the, around the stations. And what would you say to, uh, again, the people in the room around that? Uh, I, th I think um, it's encouraging uh, for us to hear you make that statement publicly um, because it clearly is showing what we think is the leadership that's required to, uh, to bring certainty to it. So if people are trying to interpret what's happening with the first phase and the second stage of LRT uh, as real estate to uh, people in the real estate community, what, uh, what impact do you think they can have and what would you encourage, be encouraging them to do? Well, you know, I, I forgot to mention phase two, construction's already underway. There was a story on CTV last night that showed all of the, the construction that's full steam ahead for phase two. And phase two brings us farther west to Moody Drive, which is the DND headquarters at the old Nortel building as well as a line to Algonquin College, farther east to Place d'Orleans and, and actually farther east than that to Trim Road, and then farther south uh, to Riverside South, which is a fast growing area of the city, lots of housing development down there, as well as a spur line to uh, the Ottawa International Airport. So that will bring us to uh, something like, I think, uh, 45 more kilometers of rail and uh, many more stations. And uh, there are many opportunities, and, and the plan has already been approved and work is being done. They're, they're building the terminal for the airport, uh, LRT. Uh, if you go by the airport parkway, you see this clear-cutting area and, and uh, cement pillars. That's where the train is going to be going over the airport parkway into the airport. It's going to have a stop at the EY Centre, which is our trade show centre. So there is a lot of opportunity all along those stations to develop um, you know, both residential and, and commercial buildings. And uh, that is going to, I think, be the most exciting aspect when you see the growth that's taking place around the stations, whether it's at the Westboro station, the Blair station. Tunney's Pasture is going to go through an entire revitalization. There are large tracts of land, LeBreton Flats, notwithstanding the fact that we had a setback, obviously, with the, the senator's uh, uh, proposal. The fact is that that's going to be the next large piece of, of infrastructure that's going to be developed and there's going to be a lot of opportunity with two LRT stations there, one Pimacy and the other one, one at Bayview. And I think when you uh, look at that site now, when I, you know, I took the train yesterday and you see how close the Pimacy station is right to LeBreton Flats, it's basically you know, a, a walk uh, a couple of metres away and you're, you're at the site of where Blues Fest is, the War Museum and then eventually uh, LeBreton Flats. So there's a, a lot of opportunity to do this kind of development within the Greenbelt without having to go and expand. And as you know, it's expanding past the green belt is expensive for you as, as developers and builders and it's expensive for taxpayers as well. Well, it's encouraging to hear uh, that um, those opportunities exist. I know the city has lands along those corridors as well. And, um, you know, I, that process is being evaluated in terms of what to do with those lands, I know. So I think we can take encouragement as a group that uh, from what you said today and what we're kind of hearing that certainty around TOD uh, stations or the LRT stations, TOD guidelines, encouraging intensification, those are things that we can count on going forward. Very much so and you know and it's not just you know obviously the transit system is important, it's the spine of our our network but there are other opportunities you know a good example is we work very hard to attract Amazon to come here for their fulfillment center it's up and running in the East End at Carlsbad Springs. 600 jobs, there'll be at f another 400 jobs I think within the next five months and then I think they're going up to 13 or 1400 jobs. 
Uh, you look at the, the film studio, that'll be 500 jobs. It'll be a, on the eventual uh, line of uh, going to Barhaven for, for phase three. What I call phase three is uh, Canada, Stittsville, and Barhaven. And um, those are the three, three of the fastest growing parts of the city. And, uh, you know, people in those areas are frustrated because they want to have light rail because they see everyone else. And I said, well, we can only go so far as the money we have. And uh, I was fortunate enough to be uh, the mayor that secured the funding for phase two, which I explained goes farther east, west and south. Phase three, we need the federal provincial government to do a 50-50 cost sharing uh, in order to get that project off the ground uh, sooner than later. And uh, I very much, you know, we've done the environmental assessment for Canada Stittsville. We know where the route is going. Uh, we're in the process of doing the EA for Barhaven. And uh, we have precedents, you know, Hamilton, Toronto, the GTA have all uh, received uh, significantly more per capita dollars for transit than we have. And uh, we will be, you know, pushing the federal candidates as we have and the provincial government to ensure they come to the table so we can go to Canada, Stittsville, and and Barhaven uh, much sooner than, than what we would project because we don't have it in our affordability plan but we think it's a reasonable request for a, a major transit system to have federal provincial funding like Toronto received 50-50 and in some cases Toronto received 100% funding. Uh, so we're not being greedy, we don't want 100%, we want 50% from the feds and 50 from the province. That 100%. <laughs> I like how you do math. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> um, so if uh, LRT wasn't enough uh, in terms of major infrastructure projects and it's been the biggest project the city's ever undertaken, is there anything else infrastructure-wise that's on the horizon or is your focus to get stage two done and going and maybe focus on stage three? Yeah, that, that's the, the biggest project obviously in our history is, is LRT. You know, it's our equivalent of the, 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 uh, the canal during Colonel John Bly's day and it's our equivalent of the provincial 417. Uh, back in the 1950s and, and 60s. But we have other projects, you know, uh, I mentioned quality of life. We have to ensure that we offer people a good reason to come, come to Ottawa. You know, we were talking about, you know, the days gone by when there weren't even that many good restaurants. You know, I, I joke with people that, you know, back when I arrived here to go to university, you know, our idea of European cuisine was Swiss chalet. So, you know, you look at the number of restaurants and chefs and, and uh, quality food operations that are here. Um, it, excuse me, we're, we're building a new library. And I've seen the, the sketches, it's gonna have that wow factor that you've seen in Hamilton and, and so on, and people think, well, what's a library? You know, who goes to a library? Well, literally hundreds of thousands of people go through the library doors each and every year in the city of Ottawa. It's gonna be really the first project at Le Breton to get kick-started uh, along uh, Scott Street. And uh, that's a big project. And it's gonna be a co-presentation uh, with Library and Archives Canada. So instead of us competing with one another for the same type of space, theaters and book space and resource rooms, we're working together. Um, you know, other projects that we've just completed, the Ottawa Art Gallery, if you haven't been to the new OAG on Daly Avenue uh, beside Arts Court, it's spectacular, one of the best uh, group of seven collections in the world. It's open seven days a week, free of charge, no admission. Uh, the Innovation Centre at Bayview, if you haven't been there and you're interested in seeing what's happening with, uh, with economic development, uh, they do uh, some remarkable work. They're bursting at the seams. We're now looking at expanding Bayview. It's right at a uh, you know, five-minute walk from the Bayview LRT station. So uh, those are projects that are on the go. And uh, in addition to every other project in growth areas, recreation centres, fire stations and so on, but it really is, you know, I'm very blessed to be mayor at this time because there's so much going on and we've got so many positive things that we're moving forward. You know, LRT, we talked about in this city for like 20 years. Lansdowne Park, we talked about revitalizing Lansdowne for 30 years. We've got a checklist and we're ticking these things off one by one, saying, you know what, enough talk, enough dithering, get the shovels in the ground and get going. And, and you're seeing that with LRT phase two, very aggressive schedule with LRT one, uh, with autonomous vehicles, with um, you know, art facilities, cultural facilities. You know, you look at uh, the success of the Shankman Center in the East End. Center Point went through an addition uh, in the West End, and uh, these are big projects. They're good for the economy, good for employment, and good for the the, the spirit of the city as well. Yeah, they're great cultural hubs for sure. It's kind of nice to see the confidence uh, and a bit of swagger too. We don't, I think, promote ourselves sometimes as well as we could, and it's nice to, nice to get that uh, that positive vibe coming uh, from your mm -hmm. office. 
So I'd like to switch gears now and start talking a little bit more about planning um, and uh, zoning and affordability. So first question I have to ask you was on the list of many people in the room is the OPA. And uh, obviously the uh, OPA 150 was, uh, was um, there was pretty significant opposition from this industry from BOMA and GOBA. And so um, I'd like to ask you about the current OPA process and some of the guiding principles that you'd like to see incorporated into the OPA to reflect where you want the city to go. Yeah, I, I missed uh, Steve's, Steve Willis's talk, but I think he did talk about the five bold ideas and, and we're receiving very positive feedback in terms of those, those five bold ideas. Um, you know, an official plan really is like our version of a constitution. We have to get it right and it has to be uh, survive the test of time so that uh, people understand that it, the principles are sound and we're not going to vacillate uh, back and forth. Uh, you know, any OPA process or zoning bylaw, there's always natural, um, you know, uh, confrontation because, you know, the development industry wants to do, you know, what they want to do. Uh, we have to respect certain provincial policies and our own guidelines and so on. And at the end of the day, my hope is that this process will be uh, much more amicable and much more uh, productive than, than perhaps uh, years gone by. Uh, but at the same time, we're not going to go to lie down and simply uh, say, you know, you want to pave the green belt or you want to go and do leapfrog development out in this area and start, you know, a whole bunch of country estates in Manatic. Uh, you know, growth is expensive and it's, it's not good for the environment, but it's also not good for your pocketbook because, you know, every time you add another 20 kilometers of road, you got to build it, then you got to maintain it, and then you got to rebuild it, and uh, that ends up costing taxpayers a lot. So there is a lot of land within the, the green belt. There's a lot of opportunities, particularly with transit and the land that the city owns. And I think you know there's a more positive, collaborative approach even with the NCC. The fact that the mayor of Gatineau and I pushed to get on the board of directors, um, we're ex officio, and that has made a big difference in terms of making sure the left hand and the right hand know what, what's going on. Okay. Great. Um, uh, some of your colleagues on council have been quite critical of you and uh, planning staff and planning committee um, about being too cozy with developers, that they've infiltrated the system and then, uh, even some comments as kind of incendiaries calling it a threat to municipal democracy. I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts or comments on the relationship uh, and if there's anything that w you know, needs to be done to adapt that. Well, I have lots of comments on it. Um, <laughs> some I can say and some I can't. There's, you know, there's, um, there's, you know, listen, healthy debate is important. Um, I think there are probably four or five uh, sort of left of, very left of center uh, members of council that, um, you know, have a different perspective than the majority on council. Uh, you know, I, I count as uh, colleagues who are reliable, centrist, um, sensible, there's about 17 or 18 out of 24, which I like those odds when it comes time to sort of pushing the agenda forward. Uh, but, you know, look at, this is all about democracy. You know, there's uh, the province uh, over the last couple of years have made it um, um, difficult uh, for companies and, and made it illegal for companies, for instance, to donate to election campaigns. So unions and corporations can no longer donate. Individual people can. And, and, and that's part of the democratic process. But, you know, there's some people I think that think uh, on council and even in the community think, oh, the development industry runs the, the city. Well, I think if you looked at OPA uh, 150 and you looked at some of the decisions we've made uh, that the industry and the industries are very upset with, you recognize that it's a balance. We're not, we're not um, going to be the puppet to a community association and we're not going to be a puppet to a development industry. We want to try to do what's best for the city and what's best for the taxpayers in the community. So, um, you know, I think, you know, there are some members of council, you know, look at everyone wants to, to be mayor. You know, if you're a council, you want to be mayor and you want to, you know, rise above and say, you know, I can say something even more outrageous, so I'm going to go and get my, my clip on the news or, or in the newspaper. So uh, I think, you know, by and large, our, our city uh, council works well. As I said, I think there's about 17 or 18 that I count as um, uh, confidants and and uh, reliable individuals that, that understand that there's a role for business and there's a role for government and it's our job not to constantly be fighting and accusing an industry that creates hundreds of thousands of jobs as our enemy. You know, uh, we, you know, from time to time we'll, we'll agree and time to time we won't disagree, but it doesn't mean that you have to start name calling and casting versions on, on uh, a particular industry that helps to build this city. 
Well, certainly glad to hear that populism isn't the, uh, the new name of the game of politics in Ottawa. And I think the uh, dialogue uh, that city staff have been having, I think in totality, not just with the development uh, industry, but uh, the business community at large has been, uh, has been very positive. And it's good to see that we don't have to have polar you know, opposites uh, arguing uh, all the time. So um, I'd like to switch now to affordability, if I could. And um, it's getting significant airplay, uh, even being called a crisis. And um, as the past Minister of uh, Municipal Affairs and Housing, so bringing back some of your past and now in your role as mayor, um, how do you think the community, the real estate community, can uh, help to uh, alleviate uh, the issues around affordability? Well, you know, there is, there is a challenge. There's about 10,000 people on a wait list for affordable uh, housing in our community. We have very few tools. We don't, at this point, have inclusionary zoning opportunities. You know, on a case-by-case -case basis, we have some, you know, moral suasion to try to convince uh, a builder, you know, you want a couple extra stories, you know, what are we going to do to try to help with, with affordability? Uh, so, you know, we're at the behest, really, of the provincial government in many respects in terms of what we can and can't do. And, Lots of changes coming down from, from Queen's Park. One of the things that we've been trying to do is to ensure from the government of the City of Ottawa's perspective is uh, we need to, uh, to have a better deal with the provincial government so they're not constantly blindsiding us with, with downloading. So, you know, we, had, uh, we started off uh, the year where the provincial government came in with their budget and they had massive cuts to public health, to land ambulance, to um, uh, our uh, long-term care homes. And, uh, you know, John Tory and I worked re really well together behind the scenes to um, get to the, the, the provincial government. And most of the uh, drastic cuts that were being proposed were rolled back, at least for one year. And now we're working to make sure that they don't uh, impact our ability. Because every time we, it costs us more money to do something that should be done by the province, it means we have less money to put into Ottawa community housing or, or other not-for-profit housing organizations. So, you know, the, the Premier and I actually have sort of a, quite a, a good relationship. Um, um, you know, believe it or not, I'm a Liberal, he's a Tory, we have philosophical differences and so on, but, you know, we get along on a personal level. He, you know, he texted me uh, last night from Kenora, which is uh, sort of neat. And, um, you know, he understands, as a former councillor himself and his brother was a former mayor, that, you know, the feds download to the province, the province downloads to the city, we have no one to download to unless we cut or we pass those uh, costs over to taxpayers. And one of the commitments I made in the election was because I wanted stability and reliability, um, we, we set a cap on our taxes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some members of council want to always move that up. They won't tell you where they want to move it up to, but, you know, we need more money, we need more money. And we just went through the budget process, or we're going through the budget process now, and each member of council comes in to see me, and I ask them what where do they like to see new spending and investment, and where are the savings? Not a lot of people come with a big list of savings. Uh, you know, lots of new projects. And so, you know, going back to the provincial government, I think, you know, to their credit, they've listened to the municipal sector, and they've started to scale back some of the cuts, because particularly when they bring forward a cut midway through the fiscal year. Well, you're all business people. You know what it would be like if all of a sudden someone said, okay, by the way, we're rolling back, you know, your, your HR budget by 20%. Well, how do you do that? You've already got the person on contract, you've paid, you know, you've, you've factored it for a full year. So we need to make sure that the three levels of government are working in, in, in harmony with one another. Because at the end of the day, there's only one taxpayer. And how do you do that? Um, you know, when you think about the past experience that you've had uh, provincially and uh, municipally, I mean, you've, your career has been in public service, and so that experience is something that you can use, uh, I'm sure, uh, to help Ottawa's voice be heard uh, in those conversations when you're talking to different levels of government. So how do you, how do you see that playing out going forward in terms of making sure Ottawa gets its, uh, its due and, and uh, gets a voice at the table? Well, I think we did that with the, the phase two of LRT. We got signed agreements, treasury board agreements with both the provincial and the federal government. Uh, and uh, you know, both the prime minister and the premier made the announcement. And, and as I said, the work is being done. So I think you know, our, our track record is pretty good on that. Um, the same thing was, you know, when we talk about a 50-50 cost sharing, our, our original affordability plan for LRT Phase 2 would only see us go to um, Place Orleans and not trim, and uh, would not see us go to the airport. So I worked with the provincial and federal governments of the day, and we got them to fund those last links 50-50, federal-provincial, federal-provincial, uh, and it worked out well. 
when I was minister, we signed an upload agreement because there are a lot of costs over the years at the provincial level that have been downloaded. A good example is Highway 174. It's a highway, it's four lanes divided by a median, yet the provincial government at, at the time, back in the 90s, uh, uploaded that to us. So guess what? We're stuck with repairing the road, which was in terrible condition, and maintaining that road, even though it's technically a highway. Uh, you know, so when I signed the upload agreement, uh, it ended up saving the city of Ottawa about $121 million over 10 years because we uploaded things like all of the social services, uh, Ontario Works, ODSP, um, the Ontario Drug Plan, all of those were provincial programs, but we were paying a portion of them and we're, we're the administrator of it and we didn't get compensated for it. Another good example, right next to City Hall is the provincial courthouse. It's the provincial courthouse, yet who was paying for security and prisoner transportation? City of Ottawa Police Department. So all of those costs have been uploaded to the province. So, you know, you have to look at it from a principal point of view. We have three levels of government, who's responsible for what, and those areas should be properly funded. So, you know, we no longer have to, to uh, absorb police costs. Those police officers can now go out and patrol the streets instead of acting as security guards at the courthouse. There's still our police, but the province is paying for it, so it frees up money for us to hire more police officers where we really need them in, in high crime areas and high traffic areas. Um, so just to put you on the spot for a second, um, we did talk about uh, LRT and uh, Stage 2 and Stage 3, so can we get you on the record about Stage 3 and can we count on it happening during your term? <laughs> Well, you know, my goal is to try to get an agreement in place. It, it, the construction wouldn't happen in this yeah. term. So phase two, um, the south end will, will be completed by the end of 2022, which is basically two, two years away. Uh, east end to Trim Road will be finished in 2024, and west end to Moody and Algonquin will be 2025. So it's not that far away. Some people wish we could go faster. But my objective would be to get an agreement in principle so that when the, the shovels are ready to go down in 2025, we can start right up again and continue going farther west to Stittsville in, in Canada and farther uh, south to Barhaven. Well, that, that's encouraging to hear for sure. Um, so I, with a few minutes we have left, I do, uh, I've been asked to ask you some personal questions so we can, we can talk about uh, Jim the citizen as opposed to Jim the mayor. So um, I have to start and I'm going to put you on the spot. Uh, what's your favorite restaurant? <laughs> Swiss Chalet. Um, uh, I, you know, it's hard. I, I, you know, I, uh, I eat out a lot. I can't remember the last, I think I, the last time I turned on my oven was about three months ago, and that was uh, uh, I, I, probably the Newport for pizza, you know, in Westboro with Mo, Mo Atella. Mo would like to be happy to hear that. That's my old neighborhood and stopping ground. Um, in Ottawa, what's your favorite place to go and why? Well, I really like, you know, the, the great thing about being uh, the mayor of a city like Ottawa is that most people don't realize that 82% of Ottawa is rural. You know, when you think of that, and, and I have a lot of ambassadors come for courtesy calls, and I bring out this map that I have, and I've had Steve's people superimpose the cities of Calgary, Edmonton, Toronto, Montreal, and Vancouver. All five of those big cities fit within the boundaries of Ottawa, and we're still bigger by 100 square kilometers. So, you know, like West Carleton, for instance, where Carp and Constance Bay and Fitzroy, it's the same size as the city of Calgary. Calgary has 1.2 million, West Carleton has 26,000 people. So I think there are more cows than people in West Carleton, I tell uh, Eli. Um, so I love going to Manatick, uh, to Watson's Mill, no relation to Andrew or I, but Watson's Mill is this beautiful old 1830s or 40s uh, mill before Confederation in this beautiful little square that has uh, an old a house called Dickinson House where I think Sir Johnny MacDonald had his campaign office at one point and there's a beautiful little uh, main street in, in Manatick uh, and some nice restaurants. So I, I like going out to the rural areas, you know, uh, the Diefen Bunker in Carp is really cool. Uh, there's a Cranberry Farm in Osgood. Um, you know, in Vanier, right in the center of Vanier, there's a, a Cabina Sucre, the a sugar, maple sugar uh, place. So some of these offbeat places that you don't always get to, you know, to see, you know, Burritts Rapids is a beautiful little village in the very far south end just at the border of Kempville. If, if anybody didn't know how frequently you get out, <laughs> they do now. This, uh, that's incredible. Um, so another question, if you weren't the mayor of Ottawa, what else would you like to be? Uh, well, I, you know, I went to university to study journalism at Carleton, so my goal was always to be a, uh, 
a newspaper reporter, columnist. So I, I'd enjoy that, but it's not the most uh, dynamic industry these days. Uh, not a lot of uh, uh, future. I still think there's a role for media and journalism that's changing dramatically. You know, social media is a blessing and a curse. Uh, you know, sometimes it's it's great. Other times, it's like you don't even know if it's true or not, and the whole fake news. Uh, situation. Uh, but yeah, no, and, and as a kid I ran a, a small printing business in my parents' basement. I had a small printing press and always wanted to, uh, to be a printer. So, so a newspaper another <laughs> industry that's not doing that well. I'm, <laughs> I think you made the right I, choice. I know. <laughs> well, speaking of Twitter, um, so my kids call me a Twitter troll because I'm not very active, but I follow people on it. So I think that's a negative thing, but anyhow. Um, uh, so who uh, writes your Twitter feed? Is that you or is that your staff? Uh, I'd, I'd say about 70% is me and then 30% are my staff. So obviously when I'm at an event and someone's taking a a picture and tweeting something, it's not me doing it. Uh, but I, I'll do it, um, you know, to the past the time when I'm sort of, uh, you know, driving around. I'm not driving myself, but I'm tweeting while I'm getting driven. And uh, sometimes I, uh, I get into these crazy arguments with people who I don't even know if they're real people. And <laughs> my staff think I'm crazy for engaging these people. So uh, I, yeah, I, you know, I, I find it's important though that politicians have to sort of uh, or anyone has to stand up and say, I'm sorry, that's not true. Mm -hmm. Like when someone writes something that on Twitter that, or in any social media that's not true, instead of just saying, well, we'll just turn the, uh, you know, the other cheek, I think you have to push back. My colleague Scott Moffat, if you don't follow Scott Moffat, you should. He gets into these gigantic battles with people in his own ward all the time. Uh, and, uh, you know, I admire his gutsiness, uh, but he probably, you know, loses 10 votes a day, you know, with uh, <laughs> these little scraps he has, but he's, he's a good guy. So I, I think, you know, you have to sort of push back and, you know, whether, you know, a lot of people offer opinion as fact. And, uh, and you have to sort of say, I'm sorry, that's just fundamentally untrue and correct it. Because if you don't, it stays out there. It's there forever, you know, and someone's said, well, I heard, you know, so-and-so is, you know, doing this or that. You got to push back, I think. Um, so now we know when you're, when you're, uh, you should also uh, be a follower of Jim's. It's uh, entertaining for sure. Um, so lastly, and I think most importantly for this audience, uh, there's a group of people that are building businesses, building buildings, uh, running companies, and uh, investing capital in a significant way, some of whom in the audience aren't from Ottawa. And so I'd like to ask you to look into the future. And um, we're not trying to push you out of office, but uh, when your term is done and you look back uh, on your term as mayor, um, what are you going to look at and what do you want to see to say that that was a success? Well, you know, it's, it's hard. Like people ask you, you know, all the time, so I'm battling my first cold of the season. <clears throat> um, you know, I, I want to obviously see the successful launch of, uh, of phase two of LRT. Um, I want to uh, ensure that we have a sustainable city, uh, both financially and environmentally and socially and, and, uh, and, and from a planning perspective. Uh, you know, we have, you know, I, I've lived in Toronto and Montreal and I've lived in Sarnia and a small town in, in Quebec called La Chute. So I've had the benefit of living in a small town, a big city, mid-sized city, and uh, I can't think of any other better place. You know, I came here as a, as a student uh, to study and I just fell in love with the city. You know, it has all of the big city amenities. You look at something like the National Arts Centre. I was at the NAC Gala the other night with Sarah McLaughlin and the beautiful new Southern Hall and the fantastic renovations that they've, they've done. We have all of these national institutions that sometimes we take for granted, but they're in our own backyard. Uh, we have the seat of government. I used to work for the Speaker of the House of Commons, and every day walking up Parliament Hill's uh, pathway to the center block was just this remarkable experience working in this place that's steeped in history. Uh, you look at the, the rural uh, countryside that we have, um, you look at local institutions, whether it's the Ottawa Art Gallery or you know, a great Canadian theatre company or La Nouvelle Seine on, on King Edward, uh, we have the, the best of many worlds. You know, we've got a, a city that I think is well managed and that is uh, a, a good size. We just, you know, turned uh, a population of a million in June, which is a, a big deal, but it doesn't feel like, you know, Toronto. It, it still has that livability and that quality of life. Uh, and yes, we have challenges. You know, we have uh, people living on the streets. We have uh, too many people that are paying too much for for housing. Uh, we have, uh, you know, crime issues like big cities. But I think it's, a, it's one of these uh, cities where, you know, the Ottawa tourism folks have, have said their, their tagline is, um, you know, uh, Ottawa, Canada in one city. 
And when you think about that, that makes sense. You know, we have rural, suburban, urban, very multicultural uh, community. Uh, we've got you know, high tech, we've got uh, people in the trades industry. It really is um, a microcosm of the entire country. And I'm, every day I go into my office or, 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 uh, or at city council chambers, I feel honored to be mayor of a city uh, that is so kind and compassionate. And, and you know, I was just at an event uh, for uh, juvenile diabetes down at City Hall this morning. And I was quoting the late Max Keeping. Max, you know, many of us know, is a former anchor of CTV News who passed away a few years ago. And Max told me two stats that always stuck with me. And I, I don't know if they're relevant today. I think they still are. He said, Ottawa residents give more on a per capita basis to charity than any other city in Canada. And we volunteer more hours on a per capita basis than any city in Canada. And that really, I think, speaks volumes to the, the quality and the caliber and the character of the people of Ottawa. And um, I'm, I'm very blessed to, to have this opportunity to serve and know full well that it's, it's a contract position and I have to work very hard every four years to regain the trust, to, to let, let me continue to do some of the work I've been doing. But I'm, I'm, uh, you know, I wouldn't pick any other city uh, in the country. And as I said, I've had the opportunity because my dad was transferred a lot to live in, in different cities, big and small. And uh, I think Ottawa has it all. Well, thank you. I think um, on behalf of the entire group, I uh, appreciate you taking the time. I know that um, uh, we don't always agree, but uh, we know that you'll always listen. And uh, uh, you showed great leadership for the city, um, both inside its borders and outside when you travel internationally. And you've shown leadership around these major infrastructure projects, which politically are you know, somewhat controversial. So on behalf of, uh, of the group here today, uh, thanks very much for taking the time. Appreciate you sharing a bit of insights on where you see the city going and on things that you like to see and do too. So thanks for being here with Thank us. You. Pleasure.